I just want to explain these medications for opioid use disorder really quickly to folks. And so here's this brochure. And on the back side, we first talk about what is opioid use disorder. Um, and we try to use really basic language. And we talk about it's a long-term medical condition. Uh, people with a condition become physically dependent on opioids and have brain changes that impact their thinking and relationships. What the heck am I talking about? What I'm telling you is that opioid use disorder is three things. You have to have three things. Physical dependence. Um, and that happens uh, over time. If everybody in this room takes opioids four times a day for a month, we're all physically dependent. That's just a physiological thing that happens. And when you're physically dependent, if you stop taking immediately, you'll go into withdrawal. All of us, everybody in the room, that's just a biological thing that happens. And withdrawal, to be clear, as I've heard it described to me many, many, many times, is excruciating. It's not just uncomfortable. It's like the worst flu you've ever had or the worst rotavirus. Or as people often will say, you know, the, you know, when you're so sick that it actually feels good to sleep on the bathroom tile floor, it's that sick. You feel that bad. You feel that close to death. So it's really, really aversive. People don't want to feel that way. So they're avoiding that by continuing to use substances. They're trying to avoid that. So the physical part is very important. We talked a little bit about the psychological part or the thinking part, which involves compulsive use, craving, this change in salience or what's important for folks, this priority becomes the most important thing is to use that substance, which of course is then going to impact your social functioning. I'm not going to be a great dad or teacher or parent um, or employee or any of those things um, if I've got this biological sort of addiction, this roller coaster of use combined with this craving and fixation on substances, I'm not going to be able to function socially well. So substance use disorder generally is all three of those things. It involves physical dependence, thinking problems, and social problems. Why does that matter? You will find out. The punchline will come back. So um, an opioid use disorder can come back if it's not tr treated properly. It relapses. You may need to try more than one type of treatment to find out what works best for you. Everybody is different. I might do well on brand X antidepressant, and my friend might do well on brand Y. We're just different. We're biologically different. So this is not a one-size-fits-all thing. So what can medications do for you with an opioid use disorder? Um, medications can help manage withdrawal and craving, reduce illicit opioid use, and two of the medications have been proven to reduce your chance of dying by at least 50%. When I talk with my physician colleagues and my prescriber colleagues, they explain medications for opioid use disorder are some of the most impactful medications they have for any health condition they treat. You know, very few people fully understand that. And the corollary of all of this is that I'm going to talk about the different medications. Two of them are opioids. They bind to opioid receptors and turn them all the way on or part way on. So they're opioids. You can be physically dependent on those medications, but you're not on this roller coaster. You're not using heroin or fentanyl pills or whatever four or six times a day. You're taking a medication once a, mouth, once, once a day by mouth. Once a day, I'm taking a pill or a film or something, and it just keeps me at a steady state. So you're off of this physiological roller coaster. And the point is, you can be physically dependent on a medication and be in recovery. You can be out of the chaos. So I think about substance use disorder, that emphasis on dis, disorder, the lack of order, the chaos. What I want people abstinent from is harm. I want them abstinent from chaos. I don't care if they're abstinent from a medication that's having far more benefit than harm, but there's a lot of confusion about that. There's a lot of confusion about those medications that somehow they are perpetuating addiction. They're not. A person is still physically dependent, but if that medication is having more benefit than harm, it's getting a person out of chaos, that's a net good. We want to support that. So the point of this flyer, and I won't go into it in full detail, is there are three medications. We describe each of the three medications. I'll describe them in a minute. They're quite different from each other. And they can also, some of them can be obtained in some care settings and not in others. So just to be really clear here, we have methadone, which people are probably pretty familiar with. I'm going to describe it more in a minute. Um, but methadone has been around since 1971. It's a full opioid. The more you take, the more effect you get. Um, it's used only in opioid treatment programs, which we t typically think of as methadone clinics, which are highly regulated highly regulated by a DEA. Your first three months of care, you have to take your medication in front of a nurse six days a week. There's nothing more structured than that. And yet I found that worked great for some of my clients when I was doing my training, because they were folks who'd been raised in chaos, and they didn't have any structure in their life. So that external structure was really important. 
and for other people it's completely counterproductive. Like, I can't get to my job and get my kid to school, that's not gonna work. So another medication came around in 2002 called buprenorphine, which is a partial opioid. It sort of goes into that opioid receptor and turns on on part way. It's a bit of a safer medication. You can't overdose on it by itself. You can if you combine it with other drugs and alcohol, but it's a safer medication, which is why it can be prescribed. You don't have to go to a clinic and have it administered or dispensed to you. You can go to a medical provider and have it prescribed to you. And so that's buprenorphine. Um, and that's also, these are both once a day oral medications usually. And there's a newer medication you may have heard of called naltrexone. The long acting injectable form is called Vivitrol. And it's a pure opiate blocker. And it's given by injection and it lasts about a month. Um, and as you'll see up here, uh, a lot of interest in methadone and buprenorphine, less than naltrexone. I think a lot of that lack of interest in naltrexone was a lot of people weren't familiar with it. But what's really important, and I don't know if I have the article in here or not, is that um, buprenorphine and methadone both have been shown over and over and over and over again to reduce mortality by at least 50%. Naltrexone has been shown over and over again, it's newer, to not reduce mortality. While people are on it for a few weeks, it certainly is protective. But the challenge with um, naltrexone is that most people don't come back to keep getting that shot, and it doesn't provide benefit if they don't come back. And there's lots of different reasons they don't come back, but in the real world, they don't. And because they don't come back, it doesn't have mortality benefit. It doesn't keep them safe. You're kind of punting the issue a few weeks down the line. And it matters because I'm doing a ton of technical assistance right now with Department of Corrections and with jails around the state, and there's an instinct to like, oh, Medically enforced absence with a once a month shot sounds great, but the effectiveness data are mixed. They're good for reducing illicit opioid use, but the challenge is we don't have good data about long term, how to keep people on, how to match them well to treatment, and so far it is not showing a mortality benefit. We're having a lot of conversations right now about, well, so what does that mean? Do we not recommend naltrexone? So I'm not a medical provider, I'm not recommending anything. I'm trying to give people enough information that they can pick something they're interested in and go talk to a medical provider about what's the best fit for them. I think one of the issues with um, these medications is that you can't get them all easily in the same setting and people have different sort of preconceived notions. I think the big thing is, is whatever a person picks, even if they're all in and super excited about it, is to recognize that relapse happens and that this might not be the right treatment for you. Medications might not be the right treatment for you. The addiction medicine doctors who I work with um, uniformly say the majority of people are going to do best on these medications for at least a couple of years. That's sort of the general consensus. We don't have research that says this person is going to do best and they can be detoxed in six months. This person should stay on for 10 years. We don't know that. So it really is this idea that we have to stay in close contact with people um, as they're working through their recovery. Is there a question there? Yeah. I'm just trying to put this together. So I'll track someone. If you, for example, were administering that in a prison setting where you could make sure they got it on a regular basis, it would probably work very well there. But what you're saying is once they, once they head out, it doesn't have a lasting effect. That's right. And so would it make sense then to transition to one of the other two, you know, or, or train them on where they can get that once they get out? So, so it's a great question. So the question is if naltrexone works when you use it, couldn't you use it in prison or long-term incarceration, but we'll talk prison, 30 days plus, uh, or longer than that, obviously, um, and then transition. So there's a couple of issues within that. Um, the short answer is you could. Uh, the medium answer is some people don't feel right on it. Um, a lot of people with opioid use disorder, when they take opioids, whether they're illegal or whether they have these medications, they say they feel normal. And some people will take naltrexone, which is an opioid blocker, and not feel normal. So they just won't feel right on it. So for some people who do like it, and there are many people who do like it and do well on it, but it's not the majority, um, they could do that. A particular issue, and I'm getting a little bit into the weeds, I apologize, is that because this is an opioid blocker, um, you, the timing's tricky. You can't have an opioid blocker in your system and then try to take an opioid medication. So that transition is actually kind of tricky. There's just that issue to deal with. Um, but the big issue, and we're actually doing, uh, hoping to do some more training with our folks who are care navigators, is if you send a person anywhere out with naltrexone, as that medication slowly wears off around week three, you need to really reach out to them and find out how they're doing, how they're feeling, how can we set you up for the next injection, and or if you don't feel right on it, how to prepare you safely for getting on these other medications. Um, it's a really, really important transition period. It's, and they're very vulnerable to relapse and to overdose. If you're on methadone or buprenorphine mm -hmm. and you were to use heroin, would mm -hmm. you feel that additional? 
Right. So it's kind of complicated and I don't fully understand all of it. But if you have very high tolerance with methadone and or buprenorphine on board, you generally are not going to feel much effect from the heroin. Um, because it's going to be occupied, those receptors are going to be occupied by these other opioids. So you can get an additive effect and can get an overdose, but it's harder because your tolerance is much higher. Yeah. Is there another question in the back? Do any of them make you sick if you do try to use on top of them? I know there are some medications ah, yeah. that will actually make people feel sick if they try to use on top of it. Yeah, so the question is about will these medications make you sick if you use on top of them? So a couple of things. Um, they no, the short answer is no. Um, the, actually let me, so for buprenorphine and methadone, the answer is no. Um, if you're using heroin and all of a sudden you take naltrexone, that will put you in a withdrawal. So that would make a person feel very sick. I think what you're thinking about is probably antabuse for alcohol. Um, we don't really have the same type of substance used in the same way for opioids. So it's it, a bit of a different set of uh, tools that we have. Okay. One last question. Please have had this one actually for years. Um, yeah. With methadone, you it says there's an opioid effect, which I hear as being you know, basically high. Yeah. So how is the high from methadone different yeah. from the high from heroin, and yeah. why is it therefore better? Yeah, so really important. Um, so if you look at this little diagram here, <clears throat> the issue is this blue line is methadone, and it, what this line means is the more you take, the more effect you get. You take not enough and you feel, still, you feel withdrawal or craving. You take too much and you can feel intoxicated and or sleepy. And if you take too much beyond that, you can overdose and die. So you have to get to the right dose for you. It has to be dosed very carefully to find that point. And not everybody can find that point. The other thing is these are also opioids. And so they can have opioid related um, side effects. People can get headaches, they can get constipation. They may not feel good on these medications. I think what I, I, think I, what I haven't been clear about yet is there are a lot of options. And what I want to take a step back and say is that this brochure is really the idea is to use this in a shared decision-making process or a treatment decision-making process. So when I got hernia surgery, my surgeon described uh, the hernia I had and what type of surgical options I had, and then I got to make the choice about my health care. In my ex 24 years of experience, that is atypical for a person with addiction. Because of their situation, socially, financially, geographically, they either have no choices or one choice. And so what I want to do is say, you have a life-threatening medical condition. You need to understand the medical condition. You need to understand your treatment options. And then you get to choose your care. Which, again, shouldn't sound revolutionary, but it really is for people with substance use disorder. 